Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Brad Shepard. Thanks for being on the show, Brad. Thank you so much, Whitney. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. I've been listening to your show for a couple of years and learned so much and been introduced to so many great people here. So incredible privilege to be here. Well, thank you. I appreciate you being a listener. And on that note, I always want to thank the listeners also that are, that are here with us today and, and every day. So grateful for you and your time. I hope that you are gaining a tremendous value from the show. Uh, but a little about Brad, he earned his undergraduate degree in finance with an eye towards commercial real estate, uh, interning with one of the premier commercial property portfolio companies in the Northwest. He purchased his first rental property within months of graduating college. Uh, congratulations, by the way, and quickly added several more before turning to commercial opportunities. Uh, his, his experience includes management of hotel, vacation properties, retail, cafe operations, as well as development of retail and hospitality space and raising capital from both domestic and international investors. Uh, Brad, again, welcome to the show. Looking forward to getting into just your story a little bit, learning more about you, and then you helping the listeners and myself to learn how you've been successful in this business and raising capital. And, and maybe we can talk about that domestic and, and international investors uh, a little bit. But uh, give us a, a little, a few of those details building up to you know, where you're at now in commercial real estate. Sure. Yeah. For some reason, I don't know if it was, it was somewhere in high school. I just got this idea that real estate was the way to go. Probably read some quote about every millionaire has real estate in their portfolio. So that just put the bug in my ear. So I went down the finance path in, in college. I always, my intention was to go into commercial real estate. That internship that I did was with a company that owned several skyscrapers. They were developing malls. So I learned a ton there. That was, that was really fun. Post-graduation, my life just took me a different direction, but real estate was always in the, in the, in the mix there. So I started building up my own little rental portfolio and this small little company I was with, we started picking up some cool little historical houses and some vacation areas, running them as family rentals. You know, this is pre Airbnb days. I think at the very end we were using, starting to use VRBO, but uh, it just really trying to you know, have, have a good time with that. And then we also had the opportunity there with some unique property. We got some land in a really cool spot. So we decided to develop that. And that's where we built this cool three-story building. It was a retail store on the main level, hotel rooms on the top and an art gallery on the bottom. Um, just had a great time with that while we continued to build up those vacation rentals. And then when I came to Texas about 10 years ago, started to get it into some of the more active single family uh, type of activities. Again, trying to build up my own r rental portfolio, but doing some fix and flips, wholesaled a couple pieces of properties, a couple pieces of land as well. And still operating some of those rentals today with all the bumps and bruises <laughs> that come along, a clump come along with that path. So have done well on some painful lessons learned on, on others. I've done it here in Texas. I had a, my wor worst deal was a a flip that I was working on in Pennsylvania. So a long, long distance flip was uh, another big lesson learned. Um, all that led me to the last three years, really just focusing on commercial multifamily. L came back to this, the commercial world realized, oh yeah, this is really where I want to be and have found the sweet spot <laughs> for me in real estate and the commercial. Nice. World. No, my, most people have some other type of way or road to, or path to getting to commercial real estate, you know, or in the syndication business, uh, very few just starting in, in, you know, right. large multifamily or commercial real estate. Uh, but no, great, grateful for you sharing some, uh, shedding some light there on just your path. Uh, and, and uh, maybe you could talk to, I know you had talked before the show a little bit about some single family units you still have, uh, and, and some issues there to compared to a syndication and our large multifamily. And then I'd love to get into some other details about, you know, just raising money and different things like that. But I thought you could shed some light to the single family versus multifamily through this, you know, pandemic. Right. You know, so you know, I, I got enticed by this idea of, of, of fix and flips and buying property sub two. Um, so did that, wanted to experience it, wanted to learn those, those, those methods as well. Um, have held on to. I haven't bought a single family property for almost three years now. 
and all of my portfolio now is in Texas, mostly in, in San Antonio and one town north of north of Austin. And some have done okay through the pandemic, others not so much. I've got two du two duplexes side by side in a cool little area in 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 San Antonio, but it's up and coming, so kind of a C minus type of a neighborhood. And as soon as the pandemic hit, one tenant stopped paying. Next month, another stopped paying. The next month, another stopped paying. And finally, about two months ago, the last tenant out of those two duplexes stopped paying. So I've got this. <laughs> this you know, almost like they were talking about that, right? Right. Exactly. You, it was almost as if they shared a piece of paper among, among each other. Hey, all you have to do is sign this little CDC paper and you don't have to pay anymore. So painful, you know, I've got four units there doing nothing. All the meanwhile, I've got it's close to a Salvation Army. We're getting a ton of um, squatters in the back. There's a pretty big lot behind the house, dumping trash back there. So I'm getting code violation notices from the city to come clean up the, the garbage to get these squatters out of there. Meanwhile, I'm earning nothing on it. <laughs> My property manager has been nice about not taking fees during this time. So I've got that on one side and on the other side, I'm getting my statements and monthly updates from these commercial syndications that I'm a part of and they just show up like clockwork. Of course, there's been some impact. There's been more people walking away from leases, but it's on such a different scale that you don't even feel it. The distributions have continued to do well. The, the, the statements are, are, are exactly what I was hoping for going in. I had a couple of properties where we paused the distributions, but all but one of them have been made up at this point. So I'm seeing those two scenarios play out one on, the, on each side of me in real time right now and incredibly grateful for the, uh, the investments on the commercial side while I'm suffering <laughs> through the, the investments on the, on the single family side. No, I just thought it was a great point to make. I mean, it's really a difference in being, you know, 50% or, or in your case, I mean, a hundred percent delinquent versus, you know, 10 or 15%, you know, worst case. Right. Exactly. Uh, and so, yeah, the economies of scale, so important. And, you know, when you can get into larger deals, uh, but, but I wanted to jump into your uh, just raising capital, you know, that ability, how you got started in that a little bit, and, and then help us to, you know, to the, get to the point to where you're at now or for the listener to see that path uh, so they can do the same thing. Sure. So having learned all those lessons, it's like many people in the last several years, we started hearing more about commercial multifamily, commercial opportunities. Um, my first exposure was through an opportunity to invest in one as a passive investor and started looking at that and thinking, all right, that, I think that makes more sense to me. That might fit better with me and my style. So I first, first started as a passive investor, really wanted to see how that would go and, and experience that. I'm really glad I did. Learned a lot just from what I was receiving from the operator there. And then from there, started getting the idea that Hey, okay. I want to go on the operators on the operator side. Start uh, start finding these opportunities for myself. I could bring together a pool of investors to 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 uh, to, to do this. So I started going to various meetups uh, meetups here in town. Um, went to a couple uh, a boot camp down in Houston, trying to just learn the multi the full multi family space. Started you know got a script to start reaching out to brokers, that whole bit. And realized, boy, this is some stiff competition and some really smart people and their teams. This is definitely not a lone wolf activity by any means. I've been used to operating as a, as a lone wolf. This is a team sport. And so as I started looking in that landscape, trying to figure out where could I play, I happened to meet in a, um, a, a few folks here in, in town where we had this opportunity to team up and function more focused really on the capital raising side to work with operators who are already successful in this world. Started learning more about that, getting to know this team. We put together some, uh, some opportunities with some operators that were doing well. Um, many of your folks on the, the listeners have heard of the, these operators and had an opportunity to really just link arms with them, join forces. I get to be, you know, come into their ecosystem without competing with them, but now just really learn, learn from them, contribute something very meaningful. Okay, perfect. No more picking out tiles, no more picking out paint, no more dealing with contractors or toilets and tenants. I just get to come in and work with sophisticated operators, successful operators, and sophisticated investors who are interested in, in playing in real estate 
placing money in real estate. Perfect. Sweet spot. I can do that all night long. So that's what I've been focused on for the last three years. Uh, and it's been incredibly fun. Nice. So uh, numerous things there that, that you learned that, uh, you know, I hope the listeners listening to and is learning or has learned as well. Uh, you know, you went to meetups, boot camps. Yeah, I mean, you had found a script so you could start talking to brokers, all those things. And you realize just, you know, the level of competition in this, in this uh, industry. And then, uh, but you know, you, you, then you said, you know, you, it's a team sport and no doubt about it. Uh, and then you, you found, it sounds like you found like that unique ability that you had or that thing that you wanted to be really good at and focused on that. Uh, and that's the investor piece or capital raising that side. Uh, tell us a little bit about like from there forward, you know, what were, were there team members that were added, you know, or, and, and what were their unique, what was their unique abilities or, you know, was there different things that you learned to help you jumpstart the, the investor side of the business? Right. So it, it was really helpful to, to work with a team, even just focus on the, 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 the capital side, because the, you know, the operators want to make sure that they're working with a team who can bring significant dollars to the, to the table. If, if they don't want to have a, a ton of relationships that they have to account for um, bringing in, you know, piecemeal, piecemeal investors. So we you know, want to make sure we were able to bring in sizable dollars. So we have grown our team um, to, to be able to, uh, to bring and really have some significant conversations to be able to raise uh, tens and twenties and 30 millions of dollars for each, for each property. So it really can satisfy a, a, an operator's entire need if they want it, want it to that, to that level. Um, and, and it's been, you know, a really an interesting journey. Um, we were trying, we've always tried to be very compliant and play above board and have everything on all the lines dotted, T's crossed um, to make sure we were doing it in a compliant manner. And then, you know, lots of people got letters last year from the, from the SEC, you know, making sure, wanting to look into your operations. So we took a pause. We just wanted to make sure, we're, okay, let's just pull back here a little bit. We think we're doing it well. You know, we've always have been advised by, by attorneys, um, but that um, really that kind of shifted our focus um, and made it more of a critical element to make sure we're doing this in the best way possible. And so we spent last year, reevaluating and then at the end of the year getting uh, some securities licensed licenses so to then affiliate with broker de- a broker dealer relationship and now all those elements are taken care of um, in 2021 looking to shaping up to be a fantastic year so 2020 was a learning a reset refocus timed up well with the pandemic <laughs> where so much was in flux last year um, but 2021 shaping out to be a fantastic year already. Yeah. So, so I'd like to shed a little light there for the listener, you know, as far as like you mentioned, so, you know, you're, you know, you were operating in a way, you know, the best way possible. You were ta- contacting attorneys, all those things. We did the same thing. And, and you mentioned a lot of people were contacted like by the SEC or, or, you know, different ways that or a lot of people were investigated, you know, over this past year, the listener, a lot of listeners may not know that I am aware with many of the situations, you know, thank the Lord we were not contacted, uh, but we were also prepared, you know, in a big way mm-hmm. and, and and try to not operate. I mean, per, so purposely in no gray area, uh, you know, whatsoever. Uh, and so, so all that to say, you know, would you uh, just shed a little light on, you know, what was being investigated? Obviously no names, anything like that, but, but why was that an issue there? Um, you know, it, what, what caused any of that? Can you just shed some light there for the listener? So really the idea is it comes down to the compensation and how capital raisers are putting themselves out there to potential investors. It, you know, a lot of it boils down to how those capital raisers, how the capital raisers are compensated. If it's a percentage of funds raised, you're doing a broker dealer capacity. You're, you're functioning as a broker without being licensed. The SEC gets really grumpy about that. So that, you know, there's different ways that some people were trying to get around that or, or deal with that with not get around it, but deal with it with, with operators. But it really comes down to that compensation focus. We decided, okay, well, we can go just become brokers, actually get the licenses and then take, just take that concern off the table. So that's how we decided to, to resolve that. Nice. No, uh, no doubt about it. There's, and we've done lots of shows. I would encourage the listener, if you have not 
heard those shows I've done with numerous attorneys just about this topic. You need to go back and educate yourself if you're not familiar with that and you're thinking you're going to go raise capital from investors. Some crucial things there that you need to know about pre-existing relationships and documenting those things. Uh, and so you know exactly where this money is coming from. But but even more importantly, like Brad's talking about, how you're paid to work with an operator. You know, if that's your if your investor relations is your piece, well, that's fine. Uh, but you need to be involved in the deal in some other capacity, and you can't be paid based on what you're raising. Uh, that was you know that raised a massive red flag over this last year for so many operators, and uh, it put a big scare in the industry. That's for sure, uh, right. or in a lot of people. Uh, so so I, I can see why you know someone like Brad would go to the extra mile now just to get this license. So there's no question. Would you explain that a little bit, uh, Brad? What, why would you get this license? What is this license? I know others who have done it as well. Uh, but uh, you know, what's the, what does this do for you? Well, one, it just, it really satisfies that compensation concern. It, I, I, now I can put myself out there. I, yes, I am representing a security. Passive investor is going to come and put their, their money into an, a, 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 an investment where there's an expectation of profit driven by the, the efforts of somebody else. That's a security. And so becoming licensed as a broker means now I can represent that security to potential investors. So had to, had to do some work to find a, uh, a broker dealer that would sponsor us. Uh, so they're going to take on the responsibility of making sure we're doing everything in a compliant manner. I mean, that's checking our emails. That's checking our LinkedIn posts. That, I mean, that they, you, you have to make sure all of that is buttoned up and, and, and information presented in, in a compliant way. So first had to find the, the broker dealer willing with the ability to take us on and, and oversee our operations. And then from there, it's, it's tests, <laughs> tests, tests, and more tests. So there's a standard exam that everybody, it doesn't matter if you're going to go sell mutual funds or stocks or, or syndications, you, you start with a, the, um, a test called SIE. You've got to pass that first. It's way more detailed than you'd ever need to know in the real estate world, but you have to pass it. That's the, the, the initial hurdle. And then for specific to syndications, there were two more tests beyond that. One is primarily about private placements. The other one's about state regulations. So you, you go deep, you go deep into these, in these topics to make sure that you're uh, being able to speak to uh, potential investors in a uh, educated way without putting yourself out there as, um, you know, we, we saw this just recently in, in this, this month of, of, of a deal raiser, capital raiser who was guaranteeing returns, saying there was no risk of loss, right? Okay, that's, I mean, there's no way you should ever say that because it's just not true. And of course, you're going to get busted. So it's uh, really just learned a ton as far as making sure we're putting information out there in a very correct and compliant manner. No doubt about it. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you just shedding some light there. I think listeners need to be aware of some of those things that are happening, you know, in the industry. And, uh, you know, just so they know as you're getting in this business, you need to understand you got to do some research here. Make sure that you're legal. We, I mean, we talked to so many attorneys and it's amazing the different, uh, you know, opinions about, you know, this topic, uh, you know, alone that you'll hear from different people. But uh, I just personally don't want to operate in any gray area uh, right. either. And sounds like you don't either, Brad, uh, you know, to go to this extent to get this license. Are there, are there one or two tips or crucial things that you could share that helped you in, in increasing your ability to raise capital. Yeah. So all, all along the way, you know, even, even I, I do generally operate as a, as a lone wolf, a specific, particularly on the, on the single family side that I just want, you know, let's just operate independently. That's just kind of how I function, but all along the way developed good relationships with other people more successful than me. And that could be other real estate investors, or that could be people who have done well in, in their own businesses their own W-2 jobs, uh, service professionals, what, what have you. So always looking for opportunities to meet people who have done well at whatever endeavor they've done. Um, that can be real estate meetups or even better, that could be other networking opportunities, um, whether it's church, rotary clubs, um, uh, chambers of commerce. I've, I've enjoyed frequenting those and getting to know people in those, in those locations. Um, and so when my focus shifted to uh, raising funds three years ago, I've got this network, you know, this Rolodex of people that I've had good relationships with. They know I've always been in, involved in real estate. Um, that's, I've always made sure that's, uh, you know, that's 
out there. They know that I'm, I'm, this is an area that I enjoy. And so then I could go back to them and say, Hey, you know, I've, I've learned some really, I've got this opportunity where you can actually be involved. Now we could work together on this and we can, um, you, I'll be your main point of contact. So, you know, so one is just always looking for opportunities to network. The real estate meetups might be good, but there might be other places that are better as, to, as far as finding individuals who are successful and want to place dollars in real estate investments. And then the second thing for me, it's, you know, I've not, I wouldn't say throwing spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks, but I've, I've learned a lot from looking at all various different avenues in real estate. My personality, I, I, I had to learn what fit with, with, with me and my style. Um, and so I think that's the second thing. Try, try it out. <laughs> you know, there's so many different ways to be successful in real estate, even in the commercial multifamily space. You don't have to be the operator. You can find other ways to be, you know, you might, many of your listeners will want to be the operator and they're going to be successful there. For those who have a different style, a different angle, different interests, there are other ways that they can be involved as well and still be very successful. Brad, you know, partnering with operators and, and looking at lots of different deals how do you like to see someone pre- be uh, to be prepared for a, a downturn? Yeah, well, um, 2020 certainly hi- highlighted that. And not that we really had a major downturn, but we all kind of stopped and paused and wondering, it, like, oh, is this it? It definitely slowed down. It changed, changed some things. So as far as the underwriting goes, we, we want to, that to be legitimately conservative, right? That, that's what, are, make sure that these numbers are accurate, we're not shooting for the stars here in our projections. We're not over promising to the potential investors. I think we've done a really good job of that with our operators and our investor partners in putting out realistic expectations of not necessarily worst case scenarios, but this is just where we should be assuming the world doesn't blow up and we, <laughs> or we just have a major collapse. But then we have the opportunity to exceed expectations and make people really, really happy. So very authentically conservative, not just saying it's conservative, but authentically, authentically conservative underwriting that then allows us to tell a very conservative story to the potential investors and become, get them excited when they see the actual returns coming through. On that same note, you know, any note, any, any per tip, predictions uh, that do you have, you know, over the next six to 12 months, are you all buying, selling? What's your plan, uh, you know, moving forward for this next year? Yeah, boy, I, I, I turned to you and your podcast and your amazing guests for those predictions. Um, but I think 2021 is, is really going to be a, a good year. I mean, it's, it's, we're coming in under a different administration. Um, so who knows that I mean, the way that might affect some tax laws, some taxes, um, 1031s, people are concerned about that. So who knows? A lot, of, a lot of questions right now at the beginning of the year. But we're an amazing country. We're, we have an amazing economy. The, the, the fundamentals are going to be the, be the same. People need a place to live. We're buying in places that are not in the middle of a city where people are leaving, but we're out there in the suburbs where people want to be, where they're heading right now. So we are, we are actively, actively buying right basically december of 2020 we turn it turn it on like all right we're ready ready to go um and so i think this is going to be a, a strong year much stronger than what we saw in in 2020 it's particularly for us in our group brad do you have any daily habits that you are disciplined about that have helped you achieve success pre-kids I was a big reader. <laughs> I have a four-year-old and an 18-month-old. So that, that, that definitely changed habits. So reading has turned into audiobooks and podcasts. So definitely making sure I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm absorbing some new information every day. Audio format has worked well for that. I can do that in between meetings or driving around or whatnot, or finding time to actually sit down with the book is much more challenging. But um, I, it was maybe three or four years ago, I got introduced to Miracle Morning, the book by Hal Elrod. I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with that. Starting the morning early to be able to have some personal time to study, to, to write some notes, to plan, strategize, exercise a little bit. And particularly with kids, I find on the mornings where I don't do that, if my little four-year-old is the one waking me up, we have a grumpy morning. <laughs> so I have to make sure I get up before them, have that personal time. And doing that just changes, changes the day and make sure I'm ready to, and prepared for, a, um, for wh- whatever the day holds. So that early, early rising has been, uh, has been critical. I appreciate you bringing that up. The, the listeners should be 
familiar with that book. I've talked about it numerous times and how it helped shape my morning many years ago. I think that was a, a, a just a big pivot in my business and and uh, in many ways. So uh, yeah, early morning and just having that structure routine has just been so beneficial. Uh, right. What's your best source for meeting new investors right now? So it, it definitely changed with the number of in-person meetings being pretty much reduced to zero. I have spent a lot of time developing. We, I spent a lot of time in 2020 developing or strengthening my, my website, um, trying developing a, creating a, 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 some information there that in, potential investors can, um, can access, just need to connect with me via email and I'll share that and uh, discuss from there. But as far as getting people to the website, um, it's, I've spent more time on the social media platforms in the last six months than I have in my entire life, probably um, strengthening LinkedIn presence and the Facebook presence and um, podcasts, podcasts such as, such as this have been really helpful in, in getting exposed to, to, to potential new investors. What's the, what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? I'm not afraid of failing. I have done well in, in many aspects of real estate and I've failed at many, many attempts. And even some of those same channels uh, have done fantastic in, in several flips and had a couple flips that just totally flopped. And I, I look at those as um, with a zero regrets. I learned a ton and made me stronger to go for the, for the, next, uh, for the next opportunities. So not being afraid to try something new um, I feel has been, has served me really well. Um, it's made me familiar and, and expert at a few, th- just a, one or two things, but a jack of many other trades as well. So just being able to put yourself, willing to put myself out there and getting embarrassed, <laughs> failing, having to co- come back to my wife and say, wow, all right, this one's painful. This one's going to sting a little bit, but Hey, we're going to pick ourselves up and keep on, keep on going. So those failures are just part of, part of getting to where you want to be. So not being, let's not be afraid of them. If you haven't read the book, who moved my cheese, you should. It's Uh a, it's, it's very short. There's even a kid's version. My kids love it. We read it often and you know, it's animated. It's really good. Uh, But there's a saying in there that they, there's things they write on this wall in this maze. And and one of the quotes is uh, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And so, you know, it helps me to remember that exactly what you're talking about now. It's so, it's so important. You know, what would you do if you you weren't afraid? Uh, Because deciding to do nothing is a decision, right? And usually it's the wrong one Uh, anyway. So appreciate you sharing that, being transparent about that. And uh, tell us how you like to give back. Oh, and thanks for that reminder. I remember reading that book 25 years ago when I was in college. I'll I'll have to go back and revisit that one. Um, But yeah, I I do enjoy um, helping people, whether that's, you know, we've got a, a young couple that we go to church with. They've never bought their, their, a piece of real estate before. So we actually had them over for Christmas Eve and spent the whole, the whole time walking them through how to put an offer in there. They, they ended up um, since then have put an offer into a condo two doors down from them to, to, to buy it. Incredibly fun to, to, to do that and guide this couple through that, that process with no realtors involved and, and how they can negotiate that and save some money there. So really fun. I, um, have had enjoyed those similar type of uh, interactions with um, people who want to want to learn more talking about talking to successful people who are, are interested in placing dollars in real estate investments without getting their hands dirty. That's incredibly fun and, and rewarding. Um, so that's a bit more on the, on the real estate side. My wife and I, we, we belong to a church that at the local level is hundred percent volunteer led. So I actually, it almost feels like a part-time job sometimes. Uh, have an opportunity to, to, to serve people uh, here in I'm, I'm in Austin. And the way we're structured is, our, you know, our, our congregation goes from the wealthiest zip codes in Austin to the poorest. And so we have this opportunity to work with people who are literally it's, it's housing insecurity, food insecurity. Um, and on a weekly basis, I've, you know, I've got my, my list of eight or nine people that I'm touching base with to make sure they're doing okay and have the resources they need. So that, uh, that, that takes a fair amount of my, my, my time, as, as well. But of course, it's incredibly uh, enjoyable just to give back to people who just haven't had the same opportunities, haven't had the same education, haven't had their eyes open to possibilities even. 
Brad, uh, grateful to get to know you again. Thank you for listening to the show, uh, but then also being a great guest and providing so much uh, great insight today to how you have gotten to the level you are now. And, and I know that came from, you know, doing uh, lots of other smaller real estate deals and getting to, you know, up to where you're at now. I mean, to not being afraid of fear. I think it's so crucial to really think about that. You know, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Uh, but even your morning routine, it's so important. It's those consistent small things that you do for a long period of time that just push you so much further forward uh, than looking for this big, you know, quick thing that's going to happen. Uh, but, uh, but also helping us think through the, the legal side of raising money and how to partner with operators. Uh, just grateful for you shedding some light on that. How can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? Well, thank you very much, Whitney. I appreciate that. The best way to get in touch is through our, our website, sugarhouseinvestments.com. Sugarhouse, my wife and I are from Utah. That's one of the coolest neighborhoods in Salt Lake City. So it's kind of a little tip of the hat to our, our Utah roots. Sugarhouseinvestments.com. That's the best place to find us. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success. 